Hello, my name is Lee Gatiss. I'm one of the trustees of the St Antolin's Lectureship Charity. St Antolin's was a church in the City of London and in the 16th and 17th centuries it was the grand nursery of Puritanism. There were at St Antolin's lectures set up for the church uh, each day at some points during the church's life. We're pleased to be able to present these St Antolin lectures into the 21st century as an annual event, looking at some aspects of Puritan life, Puritan divinity, theology and the Puritan life and times, hopefully with Puritan wisdom for today's church. You can find some of the previous St Antolin lectures on the Latimer Trust website where they're published. Uh, this one is from last year, a little booklet of Kirsty Burkett's excellent lecture from, uh, from last year, 2021, Spiritual Practices of the Puritans. Also, many of our lectures have been compiled into two volumes that you can also find on the uh, Latimer Trust website uh, and those are very reasonably priced and you'll find uh, in those uh, 20 or so lectures from the previous few decades. It is my privilege to introduce you this evening to this year's 2022's St Antolin's lecturer who is Dr Leslie Rowe. She is the author of this excellent book on Arthur Hildesham, the life and times of Arthur Hildesham, a prince among the Puritans. Uh, he was a, a great 16th century, 17th century Puritan man working within the Church of England, but struggling to do so. And this is an excellent biography of him that you can get from Reformation Heritage Books uh, or from all good booksellers online. Uh, Dr Rowe will be speaking to us this evening uh, and she often speaks around uh, the country here in England, particularly in her home uh, Leicestershire, uh, about church history and about figures from uh, her local area who were Puritans in the 16th and 17th centuries. Tonight she's speaking to us about one such man uh, who was part of the Bare Bones Parliament in the, 16th, uh, in the 17th century and uh, went on to have a very long life and ministry. So she'll be speaking to us about him and how to maintain godly usefulness in later life. So without any further ado, over to Dr. Leslie Rowe for this year's St. Antolin's Lecture. This summer, I reached a significant milestone. I became eligible to receive the state pension. I am officially old. As such, I'm part of an ageing demographic. According to the Office for National Statistics, there are currently 12.2 million people over 65 in the UK. And that figure is expected to rise to 16.5 million by 2036. How should we all approach our later years? And what can Christians of previous generations teach us on this subject? For almost 30 years, the hours of my life have been marked by the chiming of St Catherine's Church clock, close to my house in the Leicestershire village of Burbage. As I began research for a series of lectures on the Great Ejection of 1662, I was amazed to discover that one of the 35 Leicestershire Bartholomeans was buried only a stone's throw away in the chancel of St Catherine's in his 95th year. John St Nicholas, apparently pronounced Seneclas, but I'll stick with St Nicholas for clarity, had been ejected from his living after the restoration of the monarchy, but subsequently lived on for a further 38 years. This lecture, very much an exercise in practical divinity, will focus on how John St Nicholas used his time during his lengthy retirement, which I hope will serve as a helpful model for Christians today, seeking to continue serving God 
into old age. I will touch on the 17th century historical background to set St Nicholas in context, briefly trace the course of his life up to the time of the ejection, and then concentrate in rather more detail on his life thereafter. John St Nicholas's life spanned almost the whole of the turbulent 17th century, described as England's century of revolution. Politically and religiously, it was a time of great upheaval and change. John Coffey offers this snapshot of the ecclesiastical situation in 1600, only four years before St Nicholas's birth. He says... England had no permanent settlements in America and little Protestant dissent from the established church. By 1600, the internal Presbyterian challenge to the Episcopal polity of the Church of England appeared to have been foiled. Separatists had been brutally suppressed in the 1590s. And while some breakaway congregations persisted in London, East Anglia and the Midlands, they were tiny, scattered and exceedingly vulnerable. As yet there were no congregational gathered churches, no English Baptists and no Quakers. With the exception of a few thousand separatists and perhaps 40,000 Catholic recusants, the English and Welsh worshipped in the 9,000 or so parishes of the National Church. Richard Hooker could write that there was not any man of the Commonwealth which is not also of the Church of England. A century later, two years after St Nicholas's death, the picture looked dramatically different. Coffee continues. The dissenters boasted around 2,000 congregations in England and Wales, many with hundreds of members. England had become a religiously fragmented society, divided between different denominations and between church and dissent. The story of how that change came about is one that is probably familiar to most of us, at least in outline. The rise in religious tensions caused by the policies of Archbishop Lord and the Stuart monarchs the great migration of about 30,000 non-conformists to New England to escape persecution in the 1630s, the civil wars, the execution of King Charles I, and the years of religious liberty and debate during the Commonwealth and Protectorate periods under Oliver Cromwell in the 1640s and 1650s. The death of Cromwell and the inadequacy of his son Richard saw the collapse of the godly experiment to reform the Church of England. The initial hopes of religious toleration at the restoration of Charles II in 1660 soon evaporated. The bishops and their allies in the Cavalier Parliament were implacable, embarking, in David Appleby's words, upon a quest to secure church and state by implementing a rigid and exclusive Anglican orthodoxy in local government and the parish pulpit. The punitive enactments of the Clarendon Code officially pushed those with non-conformist consciences outside the Church of England. And still to come, before the century ended, was persecution, plague, the fire of London and the glorious revolution. John St Nicholas was not only an onlooker during all of these events, he also played a part in the narrative and his life was shaped by the experiences. Now, a brief biography of John St Nicholas pre-ejection. John was born in 1604 into an ancient gentry family in Ash, near Sandwich in Kent. Socially and religiously, the family was part of that group which was to form the backbone of parliamentary support as the century progressed. 
His father, Thomas, was a pious, scholarly man with an excellent library. Tremelius's Latin Bible in folio was his prized possession. In 1619, aged 15, John matriculated as a student at Emmanuel College, Cambridge. During the latter years, Lawrence Chatterton was master, and at the same time as his elder brother Thomas, 18 months his senior. The St Nicholas brothers shared chambers and remained close all their lives, having lost their mother when they were very young boys. They were united in their love for the Reformed faith and their parliamentary sympathies. After Cambridge, their ways parted, Thomas entering the Inns of Court and John living with family near Ely for a while. John's godly convictions were manifested in his financial backing of the early nonconformist colonists who'd settled in Massachusetts from 1629. Although John St Nicholas did not actually emigrate himself, he continued to take an interest in events there. He later dedicated a book to the governors and ministers of New England, declaring himself to be, quotes, a sympathiser in your joys, fears and sorrows, a spectator and observer of the mutual transactings twixt God and you. By 1630, John had married Ethelreda Goode of Stresson under Foss near Rugby in Warwickshire, and they went on to have four children who survived infancy. John and his family retained close links with that area of Warwickshire. However, by the early 1650s, John and his wife were living in Lutterworth, just across Watling Street, now the A5, in Leicestershire where he was probably acting in the capacity of lecturer at St Mary's Church, in, pl in place of the sequestered rector. John was officially appointed as rector of Lutterworth in early 1659. And it must have been a great honour uh, for him to minister in the renowned John Wycliffe's church in Lutterworth, the place where the English Bible originated. And the presumption is that John St Nicholas must have received Presbyterian ordination at some stage. But the 1650s were a sad time too for John. Two of his children, his daughter Abigail and his 18-year-old son Vincent, a London apprentice, were buried in Lutterworth Church in 1653, followed by his wife Ethelreda in 1654. Overshadowed by this personal loss, in 1653 John was nominated on the approval of Oliver Cromwell to the short-lived Bare Bones Parliament, sometimes called the Parliament of the Saints, representing Warwickshire. His brother Thomas, now a parliamentary army administrator, was nominated for Yorkshire. Thomas St Nicholas served on the Council of State but John's contribution seems to have been less prominent. However, he was appointed to serve on the Committee for the Advancement of Learning in July 1653 and was named as a commissioner for his county in the Ordinance of 1654 for the ejecting of scandalous, ignorant, disaffected and otherwise unworthy ministers. In 1657, aged 53, John St Nicholas married for the second time, travelling the nine miles or so up Watling Street from Lutterworth to Burbage. His bride was 42-year-old Lady Priscilla Gray, youngest daughter of Anthony Gray, former rector of St Catherine's Burbage. Anthony Gray, who died 12 years previously, was a remarkable man and greatly beloved. He was a staunch Puritan who had ministered in Burbage for 50 years when he unexpectedly inherited the title of 9th Earl of Kent when he was aged 82. Many pressed him to quit the ministry, but, quotes, he did not abate the constancy of his preaching, 
so long as he was able to be led up into the pulpit. Priscilla Gray remained in Burbage after her father's death to care for her widowed mother, who died in 1653. John and Priscilla did not live in Lutterworth very long after their marriage, since John was ejected in 1660 to make way for the very elderly and ailing royalist Thomas Pestel. Pestel appears to have neglected his new charge and lived in Leicester. Although St Nicholas was ejected before 1662, his views meant that in conscience he would not have been able to conform to any of the clauses in the Act of Uniformity. We know that he was a faithful supporter of the parliamentary cause, though opposed to the regicide, and as someone with Presbyterian views, he's likely to have signed the Solemn League and Covenant. If he'd been ordained by a Presbyterian classis, he would have objected to the demand for reordination by a bishop. And almost certainly he would have taken issue too with some things in the new prayer book. However, in common with the majority of those labelled as Presbyterians, he believed in the idea of a national church, though more thoroughly reformed, and desired comprehension rather than separation. Like Richard Baxter, he may well have preferred to be known as a mere Christian. Now, the post-ejection, John St Nicholas's retirement years. On ejection, John and his wife retired to live in Burbage, where Priscilla had inherited considerable property. Of the several possible locations, it appears most likely that their place of residence was the Manor House or White House near the centre of the village. Priscilla died in 1665, but John continued to live in Burbage until his death over 30 years later. He was a man of status and private means, with various properties in Leicestershire and Warwickshire. And unlike some other ejected ministers who were in dire financial straits, was not forced to make a living. But what was he to do next? Although the following list is by no means comprehensive, there's evidence for the following activities. 1. Taking stock. The abrupt end to John St Nicholas's parish ministry must have caused him to take stock of his life, looking back over past years and contemplating how to approach the future. The Puritans in general were famed for the practice of spiritual self-examination and the auditing of their lives in the light of eternity. No one knew, of course, how long their allotted span would be, but death was a certainty for all. Last year's lecture focused on the keeping of journals as part of this exercise. John's brother Thomas kept a notebook of poems for the purpose. Thomas, whose career of public service had also been suddenly terminated at the Restoration, conducted just such a spiritual audit of his own life in 1663, not long after he'd reached the age of 60. In a long and moving poem, Thomas meditated on the, quote, arithmetic of Moses in Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us, O Lord, to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Reviewing his past life, at what he calls the fag end of my pilgrimage, and desiring to know what work God would have him do in the days that lay ahead. For Thomas, that future was not a long one. He had a mere five years left. And Thomas's poem was probably written around the same date as a sermon in a manuscript notebook believed to be by John that includes the same exhortation, let us so number our days as to apply our hearts to true wisdom. 
Similar sentiments are expressed in other sermons preached in 1663, again attributed to John. At the funeral of a Mr. Burberry on the 19th of March, 1663, the preacher took as his text Job 16, verse 22. When a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. He urges his hearers to contemplate their mortality and the inexorability of the grave. Unconverted listeners are entreated to seek God while there is time, while believers are advised to lay out all your strength for God. While you have opportunity, do good, saith the apostle. Look upon yourself and think, this is the time I have allotted to improve my talent to the advantage of my master. This is the Lord's time, and proportionable to my sowing here shall my reaping in glory be. Look upon your neighbours and friends and families and say, Can death praise thee, or they that go down to the grave with all thy wondrous works? No. If these receive any good by me, it must be now. Wherein I am able to serve them must be in this life. If I do not now exhort and instruct and teach and guide my family and those I am entrusted with, I shall never return from the grave to do it. And these injunctions are further underlined by an incident that happened in May 1663. Thomas St Nicholas and his wife Susanna had been travelling by coach from Kent to Burbage to pay John and Priscilla a visit, when about 20 miles from their destination, the coach was overturned by a flash flood at Weedon in Northamptonshire. All would have perished, but for a thorn bush preventing the coach sinking into the waters. Safely back home again in Kent after the visit, Thomas composed a long hymn of praise, giving thanks to God for his miraculous intervention, and he sent a copy of his poem to John. John, a less accomplished poet, chose to reply in the same fashion, to convey the joyful gratitude of, quotes, your friends in Leicestershire for God's miraculous mercy in sparing Thomas's life. John believed that it was vital to learn the lessons that God was trying to teach them through this deliverance. Notably, that the reason they had been given more time on earth was in order to do some more good for God. John wrote, Lord, let thy warnings mind us what is past to keep us humble. Let the pleasant taste of mercies in deliverance engage to serve thine honour with renewed courage. That as thou givest us newly life to see, so may we give a life that's new to thee. Our soul from death now saved, our eyes from tears, our feet from falling into dangerous fears. To know thy righteous paths, let our souls muse, our eyes discern them, and our feet let use to walk this life as in thy presence, who has made this life a land some good to do. And doing some good for God was thus the guiding principle of John St Nicholas's remaining years which underpinned all of his actions. Two, maintaining close relationships. This episode in 1663 also highlights the importance of relationships, never more necessary than in retirement years. While his brother Thomas was alive, they corresponded regularly. And though they lived some distance from each other, they obviously took pains to arrange visits, thus supplying the mutual solidarity and affection so essential to both. Like many others, John had to cope with a long period of widowhood, more than 30 years in his case, 
but he was fortunate to have the support of a large extended family and network of friends who lived locally, including his son Timothy and daughter Mercy. In his poem, John mentions friends in Leicestershire, and these may very well have included a group of fellow Bartholomeans who sought refuge in the nearby village of Stoke Golding in the 1660s. Senior amongst these was Nathaniel Stevens, former rector of Fenny Drayton. Of a similar age to John, Stevens had been forced to contend with the emergence of Quakerism in his parish in the form of George Fox. Stevens was not as long lived as John, but he was remembered as being pleasant and cheerful in his latter years. A friend recounted paying a visit to Stephen's home in Stoke Golding one day, when only Nathaniel and his wife Joan were at home. No one came to answer the door in response to his knock, but Nathaniel's voice called them to come in, asking, quote, whether of the two they would have had opened the door for them, the blind or the lame, his wife being blind and he so lame as not to be able to rise out of his chair without help. 3. Continuing his calling The ejected ministers referred to St Bartholomew's Day 1662 when the Act of Uniformity came into force as their civil death. Their calling was to preach the gospel of Christ and to pastor their flocks, and now those who could not in conscience subscribe to the act were legally barred from their parish pulpits. Supervening measures of the Clarendon Code restricted their preaching activities still further. Opinions differed as to what extent they should obey the law or defy it and suffer the penalties. Many, like John St Nicholas, still regarded themselves as part of the Church of England and hoped for re-inclusion. And so he continued to attend parish services in St Catherine's for as long as he was physically able, as well as preaching to gatherings or conventicles which met at times that did not coincide with those services. If indeed the manuscript volume of sermons dated 1662-3 is the work of John St Nicholas, the sermons are likely to have been preached in or near Burbage in these years. Under the indulgence of 1672, John was licensed to preach as a Presbyterian at his house. And in 1690, when he was 86, he is again reported as preaching in Burbage. In that same year of 1690, there is also mention of him preaching to a large congregation in nearby Hinckley, taking the place of his deceased son-in-law, Henry Watts, another ejected minister whose third wife was St Nicholas's daughter, Mercy. John was still only 58 in 1662, presumably still in his prime as a preacher. However, a note of caution needs to be raised at this point. It's very possible for a preacher to outstay his usefulness in pulpit terms. Although John may have been excellent at 58, we do not know what he would have been like at 86. We may admire the stamina of elderly preachers, but is it possible that the attempts to persuade his esteemed father-in-law, Anthony Gray, to stop preaching in his final years had as much to do with him being over 80 as to his becoming the Earl of Kent? Sometimes people are just too embarrassed or loyal to say. And this was certainly the case with another ejected minister, Stephen Ford, former vicar of Chipping Norton in Oxfordshire who went on to establish a congregational church in Miles Lane in London. Twenty years later, when Ford was becoming decrepit, the church invited Matthew Clark the Younger from Market Harborough in Leicestershire to minister alongside Ford. But it is recorded. 
It was some time before the providence of God smiled upon this undertaking. For though the Reverend Mr Ford was in the decline of life, he was unwilling to be thought to have outlived his usefulness, and therefore filled the pulpit oftener than was desired. This hindered the increase of the auditory, and together with some other unkindnesses which Mr Clark met with, laid him under great discouragements. When Clark finally took over the whole of the work, after the aged Ford's death in 1694, it is reported that, within a year or two, his auditory was crowded. Vast additions were made to the church. 4. Showing practical kindness to other ejected ministers. John St Nicholas used his property and assets to help other ejected ministers in need. John had a house at Knoll in Warwickshire, and when he heard that James Wright, ejected from Wootton Wowen in the same county, had nowhere to go when displaced by the Five Mile Act in 1666, he wrote Wright a letter in which he quotes, invited him to Knoll, telling him there was a chamber, bed and study there, which he should be welcome to. James Wright gratefully accepted the invitation, later keeping a school and preaching at the house. Another ejected minister who'd fallen on hard times, old John Gilpin of Brinklow, was also able to live in the same house until his death soon after. In addition, St Nicholas left 20 shillings in his will for the support of Richard Southwell, an ejected minister who had moved to Dadlington and was preaching at Hinckley. 5. Keeping intellectually and spiritually active. In his later years, John continued to study the scriptures and write books. It was said of him that he was an able scholar who to the last, into his 90s, was used to style himself a student in St Paul's epistles. And this reveals both his humility and a desire to always be learning from God's word. In 1642, at the request of Parliament, John had produced an English translation of a famous Puritan work written in Latin, the Marrow of Sacred Divinity by William Ames. And in 1663, he issued A Help to Beginners in the Faith, it's apparently no longer extant, which contained explanations of the Creed and the Lord's Prayer. This was followed by The History of Baptism in 1678, dedicated to the memory of his deceased father-in-law, Anthony Gray and written with the purpose of encouraging unity between Christians. John offered this work as, quote, the fruits of his retired thoughts in old age, asking allowance to be made for human infirmities. And he was surely thinking of Psalm 92, verses 12 to 14, where the righteous are described as flourishing and still bearing fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. Finally, in 1695, when he was 90 years old, John wrote what has been described as the final fruits of his attenuated old age. A pamphlet poignantly entitled The Widow's Might, giving his exposition of Christ's sufferings based on Luke 24 verse 26. And although it's beyond the scope of this lecture, both of these latter works, while showing a commendable desire for church unity, also display evidence of that Baxterian soteriology so ably critiqued by Dr James Packer in Volume 5 of his Puritan Papers. 6. Setting an example of steadfast faithfulness. Even as his capacities declined with advanced age, John continued to live in Burbage in the mansion house and set an example to others. As a man of high standing in local society, people took note of what he said and did. 
And what was said of a Shropshire Bartholomew could equally have applied to John. When he could not do what he would, he did what he could. And it is recorded that St Nicholas went to the public church as long as he was able to go abroad, notwithstanding that he was for many years so thick of hearing that he could not hear a word that was said. And when he was asked why he would go to church when he'd lost his hearing, he declared he went to give an example to others, being afraid that if he should stay at home on the Lord's Day when there was a sermon in the church, others might be encouraged to stay at home and keep from church too, though they had no such difficulty as he laboured under. The rector of Burbage initially was John Pitts, a godly conformist, and he and St Nicholas evidently shared a mutual respect. Two later rectors served in Burbage during John's lifetime, with whom he appears to have had cordial relations. By way of conclusion. In John St Nicholas's final years, death and perhaps unable even to take the short walk from his house to the church, he lived, it is said, secluded from the world, his chief amusement being his library. The last glimpse we have of John is in his will, made 11 months before his death. Obviously very frail and barely able to sign his name, yet he declared, I do, through the grace of God, in the comfort of a good conscience, humbly commend my soul and spirit into the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ, my most gracious and blessed Redeemer, whom I have served, whom I have loved, in whom alone I trust for acceptance with his Father and my Father, in whom also I rejoice in hope, to be raised incorruptible in the great day of his appearing. To him be given glory and dominion in the unity of the Father and blessed Spirit for ever. Amen. And then, in an echo of Psalm 62, My soul waits for thy salvation, O Lord. John died on the 27th of May, 1698, aged 94 and was buried in the chancel of Burbage Church three days later, next to his second wife, Priscilla. The gravestone is no longer visible, but his epitaph has been recorded. It read, Resting in Hope, a reference from Psalm 16, verse 9, My flesh also shall rest in hope. Many years earlier, John had explained what that hope of resurrection meant. God's powerful word, O believing soul, shall gather thy scattered dust and join thy crumbled bones, shall burst the bands of death and the shackles of the grave. The sound of the last trumpet shall awake thee from so long a sleep, and when that joyful morning shall begin to dawn, you shall have such a summons that thy heart shall leap to hear and the prisoner of hope shall come forth. I think I take over at this point, first of all, with a, a big word of thanks uh, to Leslie for all the material there. I certainly find a sort of echo in my own heart, having also equally, uh, I must be virtually the same age as Leslie, having, having uh, attained retirement age and state pension and so on. Uh, remember, this is the opportunity now to ask questions. I'm going to kick off. Uh, OK, I can really see some coming, but I'm, I'm going to have the privilege of kicking off with one, really, which is about his, his preaching. I wonder if, Leslie, you could say any more about after the ejection, after his ejection, what were the sort of occasions that led him to preach in conventicles? You mentioned a funeral sermon, for example, but there he was faithfully attending the parish church. It, I'm just interested to know what sort of occasions and opportunities he took up for preaching, if you've got any idea of that. 
Uh, it's a very good question, but it's quite difficult to answer because I it might obviously be. yeah. the tentacles were illegal. Yes, so that yes. records and yeah. information would be restricted perhaps on that. Um, and the sermon notebook that we have, um, which is purported to be his work, I'm not sure because nobody yeah. has an yeah. example of his handwriting, there are several uh, funeral sermons, of yeah. which, but that only um, refers to that, those years, 1662, 1663. But I'm sorry, I don't have any information. No, no, I, I feared that might be the answer, yeah. but it was just it was just the idea that um, yes. you, know, you in retirement you think, well, or sort of in his circumstances, you think what opportunities for preaching should I take up, especially given the yeah. legality uh, sort of things. But I can imagine funerals being ones which he felt were particularly important for the pastoral yeah i think you mentioned him preaching in the in the nearby woods at one point uh this is i don't know whether i included this in the lecture i i think this is local folklore it may be highly romanticized and people's idea mm. it may have just been within his own home and then when the uh, meetings were being held in hinkley which he was involved in that group grew bigger and bigger, but it started in in houses and before buildings were constructed. But um... let, let me um uh, uh, sort of steer towards you, Leslie. Well, it's it's a question that comes in several parts, but I think these two go bits together. Why did he not support the regicide? And was that a common Puritan thing? I thought they all supported killing the king. I think that's a good one to go go for. Uh, very few of the Presbyterians believed in killing the king. Um, perhaps, um, perhaps some Congregationalists, perhaps some Baptists, but very few Presbyterians um, supported that. And, and would you say that he, I mean, there's evidence, presumably there's evidence, which you've said that he did not support the regicide. Yes. side. Uh, he preached one of these sermons in the notebook, which I haven't studied in great detail, um, was preached on the anniversary of Charles I's execution, which he deplored it. But as I say, I haven't really studied that because it didn't seem to have... No, OK. No, but that's... This, um, um, yeah. that well, I, I'm going to keep going on these ones. I don't know whether they're coming from different people, but uh, why did he still attend the parish church if he was kicked out as a minister? Now that's quite a, a profound spiritual sort of issue to think about, isn't it? Yes, but I think this is um, because of the, those who are labelled as Presbyterians, um, really their, their idea uh, was to stay within the church. They considered themselves still to be part of it. So they were su supportive of, of a national um, church. Yeah. Um, he would obviously not have um, taken the Lord's Supper. He wouldn't have been allowed to, I suppose, but he wouldn't have done. But while the, the key thing, I think, in that quote is while there was a sermon in the church, he wanted people to encourage uh, to encourage people to continue going. And perhaps he, he hoped that they would perhaps all be united again one day. Do you, sorry, just a uh, follow up from me on this, because it's a natural thing that follows on, I think. Uh, uh, you said he had cordial relations with the ministers there. So presumably he appreciated the fact that there was good, godly preaching there. Yes. I mean, certainly the first minister, John Pitts, yeah. who was a godly conformist, he yeah. um, gave evidence of his Puritan and parliamentary sympathies by signing the Leicestershire addresses to Richard Cromwell in 1658, um, along with um, John St. Nicholas. So he would have known him quite well before um, he was ejected. Um, mm. but sometimes sometimes these, these, uh, there are a lot more nuance to some of these situations yes. that we tend to think, aren't there? Yes. What about this one? Was he a Baptist? You said he wrote a book on baptism. <laughs> I think I know the answer, but I, it's very much, uh, I would like to hear what Leslie would say about this. Yes, uh, as a Baptist myself. Um, he, oh, yes. uh, somebody cited him, uh, some Baptist historian uh, in the 19th century, I think, cited him just on the title of the book as uh, 
Baptist or a proto-Baptist. He certainly <laughs> wasn't. Uh, he was um, a Peter Baptist. He was a member of the Church of England and a Presbyterian who very uh, strongly support uh, infant baptism. And you've got to think that Baptists at this stage were weird and wacky. They were sects. You know, most Orthodox people wouldn't have accepted them at all. And no, it, uh, it doesn't support that line. There's plenty of questions coming in, but can I just have a brief follow up on that? In that book, would he have had a sort of covenantal view of of infant baptism or things? What, what, did he have a particular point to make in that, do you think? Yes, but it's that the ordin ordinance of baptism united all true Christians. Mm -hmm. The fact that they had received baptism meant they were one because he was trying to write for Christian unity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, right, here's here's one. Oh, it's got it's got a label on it because it comes from Ross. Are there any potential dangers to consider with respect to continuing ministry in later life? Mm. Yes. Can you fill it out a bit more? I guess the, the yeah. later life and stuff. Are... Yes. Well, I think that this is is true. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows uh, people who have got older and have continued to do things. They've always done them so well but they no longer perhaps have the capacity or the gifts, but they don't recognize that. So I think it's very helpful if you have a spouse or a close friend who can gently speak to you if you can no longer do what you used to do. And there are phases, aren't there, in retirement. We don't necessarily keep doing the same things because um, our capacities change and God may have something else for us to do but I think I don't know about John St Nicholas but the example of the other minister that I quoted quite obviously he'd been a fine preacher and people were very grateful for his ministry in years past but he was going on too long yeah I mean I can uh, I don't know if you don't mind I just I'm uh, keeping an eye on the time but uh, I, it is a thing that re in retirement you face because you suddenly you're so used to preaching every week or something like that, it becomes part of your identity. And when you retire or ejected, yes. you suddenly have to consider, why am I doing this? Or what, you know, and you wonder sometimes whether you people keep on doing it because it's become so much part of their life that they cannot conceive of life without it. Mm. Yeah. So I'm going to keep going. Excuse my, uh, I think I'm going to, uh, you've answered this one, I think. Would you have taken communion in the parish? No, I don't. I don't think he would have done. But would that have varied over the sort of thirty years or so from his from sixteen sixty? I have. I have no evidence. Yeah, no. But Lee, would you know? Would, would would there have been times when Presbyterians would have been able to take communion? Yeah, you see, this is. Uh, I think Leslie's right. They, they very probably he did not, but he'd be happy to attend. Um, and be in communion, in partnership, in fellowship with the, the Christians there. But to actually take the sacrament um, in the Church of England was uh, saying something else, that not all of the nonconformists were happy to do. Many did um, attend their parish churches and, and take communion, but uh, many, many would not do that. There was a, a thing later on, of course, um, uh, under the Clarendon Code, that you were barred from taking any office in the state or the local council, even um, if you weren't an Anglican, and you proved that you were an Anglican um, by conforming and taking the Lord's Supper at least three times a year. Um, and so, some nonconformists who were known as Presbyterians or Congregationists in conviction would actually take communion occasionally in order to qualify and this occasional conformity um, as it was called was um, a source of scandal amongst some in the non-conformist community yeah yeah so it was it was quite a key touchstone clearly yeah yes and from there we get that sort of common thing even now in the church of england that uh, that you you should take communion three times a year at the three major uh, times Festivals, when communion yeah. is celebrated yeah. right during the year um to be yeah. a proper anglican this is what um you know being an actual communicant member of the church means taking communion three times a year 
Right, good. Uh, now, here's a good one. Uh, you mentioned Richard Baxter. Was he an associate of Baxter? What sort of relationship? Is there anything known about his relationship with Richard Baxter? I've been trying to uh, prove a direct link because I think he could well have been, but I have no proof. There's an absence of information about John St. Nicholas's life really between the early 1630s and 1650. But we know that um, another man, Nathaniel Stevens, that I mentioned, um, who lived close by, he was one of the ones that spent time with Richard Baxter in Coventry in 1642 during the Civil War. And we know that there were 30 or so nonconformist ministers at some periods there with Baxter. But I only have the names listed of eight of them. So he might have been, but I, I don't know. Yeah, OK, OK. Fascinating to think he may have been one of the ministers who was uh, getting together to hear Baxter give the sermons that became the Reformed Pastor, the very famous book that Baxter never got to give as sermons because he was ill, but he wrote them up uh, instead. But they were supposed to be sermons Ooh. given at a day of humiliation for some local pastors. I wonder if St. Nicholas could have been one of them. Ooh. OK, um, probably the last question, although I still have one, which I, I would be just quickly like to like to ask but but here's one um how how could he live after losing his ministry in in 1660 well it's a 62 but it was 60 wasn't it mm. well he married two heiresses uh, i'm not sure uh, he was a younger son mm. so i don't know how much he inherited from his father um he may have had inherited something there but his first wife was um an heiress in stretton under foss um, so she, he would have inherited that money. Then when he married Priscilla Gray, she had considerable property um, in, in Burbage, yeah. probably other places too. Yeah. So in Warwickshire and Leicestershire, he had these various uh, properties. But he also, I didn't mention it in the lecture, but he kept a farm as well, right. which probably helped to supplement his income. Yeah, and yes. of course, he if your father-in-law is the Earl of Kent, that's going to help, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. But he did use it, as you said, to help others, didn't he, as well, and assist others who are in need. Yeah. yeah. Can I just sneak in one last question, which is, what do you think inspired the topics for his books in in retirement? I mean, you said the baptism one was thinking about unity. I'm kind of trying to remember what the other ones were. It's, it's just interesting well, to think about that. Well, mm. the widows might. Um, yes. Again. Uh, it, if I understand it correctly, he wants to uh, bring people together because he wanted yeah. to be part of this national body. Um, but he's discussed, this is where the Baxterian bit comes in more because he's discussing what Christ's sufferings meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK, that, that's, sorry. Well, I'm, I, yeah, it's really just a very interesting to see what, uh, yes. yeah. yeah. Very worthy well, I, subject of meditation for retirement, the cross. Yes, well, yes, it, it is. But yeah, no, it, it's, um, yeah. Oh, I've got a note here. Well, as we come to a, a, a conclusion, remember it is St. Nicholas's Day. I don't know whether John St. Nicholas would have celebrated St. Nicholas Day, but we can certainly note it is St. Nicholas Day on which we're speaking and thinking about and have indeed learned a good deal from the example of John St. Nicholas. And I want to thank Leslie very much indeed uh, for, well, well, it's just great to hear this stuff, which you, from someone who's carefully researched uh, the material and has um, been, been able to make it widely, more widely available through this lecture live, it will also be available um, on the uh, uh, you know on a YouTube link in due course, and also will be published as well uh, via Latimer Trust. So keep a look out for those things, and you can get the published version of last year's uh, St. Andalin lecture by Kirsty Burkett. But I think it's right for me now to uh, close in prayer. Thank you to all for attending, and again, thank you for listening, and thank you for Lee's uh, hosting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come back to that verse about teaching us to number our days aright. Lord, we do not know the future, but we pray that we may live in the, in the present as uh, 
the example of this past saint, John St. Nicholas did, uh, living uh, to serve you and to do what good he could. Lord, may that continue to inspire us in times of joy, times of sorrow, in challenging circumstances as well. May we be useful in your service and so bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, you should also buy a copy of Leslie's excellent book on Arthur Hildersham, A Prince Among Puritans, another Puritan with good connections to the aristocracy. Excellent. Good book available from Reformation Heritage Books and all online booksellers.